So hi and welcome to another uh, episode of Feature Fridays. Uh, my name is Guy Bartram. I'm Product Marketing Manager for the Cloud Director Suite of Products. And today I'm joined by Brandon Gordon and Jörg Liu. So uh, Brandon, uh, welcome to the show. So please introduce yourself. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Brandon Gordon. I'm the tech marketing for VRLS Operations. Excellent. Thanks for joining us today. And Jörg? Uh, yeah, my name is Jörg Leif. I work as a technical product manager in VMware's Cloud Service Business Unit. Thanks very much. Okay, guys. Well, today we're here to talk about uh, vRealize operations, as you can see uh, with the vRealize operations manager console up there on the screen. And uh, Brandon, thank you very much for joining us and you know providing your expertise in this area. It's much appreciated. Um, what we wanted to cover today was uh, you know the, the provider uh, service provider view on using vRealize operations, how a provider can use this, uh, how they would pay for it. Uh, the type of uh, capabilities it will provide to them. Um, in another separate episode, we'll cover some of the monetization aspects of it, but let's just kind of hit on that a little bit today so we get sort of a broader picture on, on why vRealize operations is a good idea for service providers. Um, and yeah, let's start then by kind of looking at, uh, you know, what is vRealize operations in a nutshell, if we can sum it up in a, in a couple of minutes and how does it benefit uh, a service provider? Uh, certainly. So usually when we talk about realized operations, we, we talk about the, those four pillars. Um, so they, it really aligns with what you see here on the, the start page. So we have I'm broken out here for optimized performance is this first pillar. So this is you know, getting, you know, getting the best, you know, the best performance of your, out of your environment, uh, making sure things are you know, running as optimally as possible. So that's why you see like work, workload optimization and right sizing um, under this pillar. Um, so, you know, it's all about performance. Um, then the second pillar here is optimized capacity. So this is looking at your environment from a capacity uh, perspective. Um, so making sure, you know, you have enough capacity or you know, know where they're running out, um, resources that you can potentially reclaim to, to get capacity back, planning, which is, you know, adding resources, either VMs, removing VMs, adding hosts, removing hosts, and then looking at your environment from a cost perspective, um, you know, understand how much it costs for your infrastructure um, to run the virtual machines. Uh, this next pillar is troubleshooting. So this is looking at, you know, identifying problems, um, you know, whether they're known problems or unknown problems um, and, you know, and dealing with those. So the troubleshooting workbench is more, you know, finding Finding um, unknown causes to problems. Um, then we have alerts, which are basically known problems um, that have been identified by the system. We have links to logs for log insight. And then a lot of dashboards that help you dive into the data. And then the last pillar here is compliance. So this is looking at configuration issues from, um, or uh, also looking at it from a uh, compliance perspective. So that's like the big high level uh, overview. So it kind of you know, benefits in all of these, these pillars here. Yeah, it's really interesting actually because uh, just you mentioned the log management stuff. So, as a service provider with the Flex Core policy, you get Log Insight included in your your Flex Core policy, whether you use it or not. But what we're able to do here then is another layer of examination and uh, aggregation on top of Log Insight to pull in all the event data and alarms from the real operations, right, and get a correlation. Yeah. Yeah, so like when you're looking at, when you have the integration between the two products, when you when you look at an object in VRealize Operations, you'll have a Logs tab and you just click on that Logs tab and then you'll see the view of the logs for that particular object that you're on. And then 8.1 added in additional capabilities for um, that integration. So like you have the number of errors that are seen for a particular object actually as a metric, the number of warnings, and then the total number of, of log messages for that object. So kind of get you, you can trend, you know, like if, is the number of errors going high or, or, or is it trending down or you know, whatever, like things like that. So it, it really helps from uh, troubleshooting just to have you know, those three simple metrics. Yeah, and I guess those logs, um, once they start incrementing and the counters start incrementing behind them, they'll then become alerts that's when certain conditions are met? You can do alerts. You can also leverage the dynamic threshold capabilities that's in VRLS operations. So you can detect when the, the number of alerts is basically uh, abnormal. Uh, so you know, typically you, you would only, or number of logs, sorry, like typically you would maybe have three logs per hour um, that are that are errors. And if it jumps up to 100 per hour, it'll see that as being abnormal. Um, and you can actually create an alert on that saying, you know, 
your errors are abnormally high, you know, you probably want to go look at this virtual machine. Mm -hmm. uh, and then deviation you know, from normal type stuff. Yeah. Cool. I mean, it, so there's two kind of major things here. I mean, well, actually, the, there's four major things. But I think from my perspective, the conversations I've had with service providers around um, the optimizing of performance and the troubleshooting being like the key ones, uh, you know, service providers plugged in, vRealize operations, suddenly they're understanding they've got a whole load of underused capacity um, in which they can take more advantage of. And Equally, I've, I've heard them say that, you know, they've found problems that have been bugging them for a year plus, and suddenly they're like, boom, there it is. Uh, you know, and I guess this is one of those situations where, you know, VMware understands VMware technology the best <laughs> and can provide yeah. this kind of correlation for it. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, that, that's the idea is to, is to, you know, monitor the environment and look for potential problems and leverage our, uh, you know, collective knowledge that we've learned from, uh, from all the all the other customers that are using uh, managing vSphere. And tell me, does does vRealize operations uh, understand the concept or be able to model the concept of an SLA, which is obviously key to the service provider providing a service? Yeah. So uh, the the way you would do that is um, basically you figure out what your SLA is. Um, so that could be like some customers say, you know, they don't want to have their ready time for their virtual machine to exceed a certain percentage for a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, so you could actually, you know, basically you could create um, an alert that says, you know, the ready time has exceeded that, or you can do some more um, advanced stuff like say, say um, automatically track, you know, the, the amount of time that the, the, the machine has been above that threshold. Mm -hmm. So basically you can create like a, you know, a Boolean thing that says, yes, it's been met or yes, it's exceeded. And then you can kind of trend that over time. So that that's not, it takes a little customization to, to do that, but that definitely is possible. Um, that's something... Um, there, there's there's a blog I can uh, I can send you that will kind of tell you, you know, more practical how to implement that, but it's definitely it's definitely doable. Okay, cool. That's good to good to know. All right, so we've talked about um, these these four pillars. Then can we dive into a little bit more detail on how a service provider can utilize these in their individual kind of silos and maybe walk into some of the optimized performance uh, stuff? Because obviously, service providers want to run their service, provide an SLA, provide, you know, not, they don't want to have situations where customers are running out of capacity and running out of performance and experiencing issues. That would be very bad. But equally, at the same time, they want to sweat the assets to the point that they're making enough margin out of it <laughs> without exactly. the customer being disturbed. Yep. So um, I, I'd probably start here with the, the assess capacity one. This one, um, I think, is is a really important one. So i what I've got here is, show, is showing a list of all of my data centers. Um, so you can see it's it's grouped by how critical they are. So I've got four up here that are critical, and then I've got a bunch on here that are normal. Um, so I'm going to pick on production because uh, you know, production is important, right? Yeah. Uh, so what I, what I get when I do this is I can see uh, I've got three clusters that are critical. I've got one that's warning and then one that's normal. So you know, three clusters that, that marked critical is kind of um, you know, suspect. You know, I, I want to investigate that. I've got some recommendations here, what I can do. Uh, so I've got um, some potential cost savings. So this is you know, $90 a month if I do some reclamation. Um, so I, I can talk about that in, in a little bit, what, uh, how you can actually see what's reclaimable. And then optimization, which is like moving VMs between uh, clusters. So the rebalancing kind of. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So um, just to show you here, this one is the most critical cluster. So the way, the way we look at from a capacity perspective, we look at it from the terms of days remaining. So that's how many days until you're, you're going to run out of capacity. And what this does is this looks at the historical trends that the, you know, the workload has been, um, you know, has been doing. And then it takes and projects that out into the future to figure out you know, what, that, what the utilization will look like in the future. And it says, okay, when, when will that utilization cross the amount of capacity that I have in that cluster? So you can see this is saying, based on my you know, current projection in eight days, this, this particular cluster will exceed my usable capacity. So it gives me this, this early warning and gives me enough time to go and address it. Eight days is probably not enough time to address it, but uh, you, know, you want to have like here where this one's going into warning. Um, so I have 93 days to add capacity for this one. So this is 
you know, this is where, you know, as the, you know, as the provider, you would say, okay, well, I need to go look at this cluster. It's saying I'm running out of capacity in the next three months. You know, if I need to go buy hardware, you know, you know I want to have enough warning that says I can go, you know, get the, the purchase order and all that stuff done to, yeah. to get the hardware on, you know, purchased and installed and stuff. So the idea here is, you know, you can look at this from, from that pr perspective. You also have the ability to, um, dive in. I, this one is pretty cool. So I just double clicked on the cluster and I see you know, here's the time remaining, but I also have capacity remaining. So this is saying I have, I've only have 2% of my capacity remaining based on disk space, 32 or you know, about 33 gig of disk space left. That's the most critical constraint on this environment. And based on the average virtual machine, I can fit two more virtual machines in this cluster. So that seeing it from a VM's remaining often resonates better um, than just seeing time remaining. So it's like, you know, I only have eight days left and I can only fit two more VMs. You know, that's pretty critical. Um, you know, that just kind of helps you understand even more what was going on. And there's a lot of data here that goes into the, the details of why it's saying, you know, with this, but it's, it's basically on disk space is why we're running out of capacity here, so. So does it, um, just let me know, Brandon, when, when you're looking at Cloud Director, for example, where you're doing a reservation versus an allocation, how does vRealize operations translate that into these capacity views? Yeah, so you can, um, from capacity, let me go back to the, show you the settings you have here. So this is looking at the underlying um, vSphere cluster itself. So we have options. So by default, the system looks at it from a utilization perspective. So it knows that based on your demand, that's what we have demand here. So this is, demand is based on the actual utilization of the, the cluster. Um, so this is saying, you know, based on what's actually being consumed, this is my projection. And then allocation is based on allocation models. So that's like saying, I want to overcommit by a certain amount. Like say I want to do four to one CPU to core, um, I can, I can set that here um, and that's in the settings here. So I can go in and say okay. from an overcommit perspective, I've got this configured for eight to one on CPU, 1.5 to one for memory and five to one for disk space. So this allows you not only to look at it from a demand perspective, you can also look at it from an allocation perspective. And does this pick it up from, from vCenter? So if you configure it in VCD obviously gets configured in vCenter. Does this then read that allocation model from vCenter? It, it does not, no. Okay. So this is something you would have to configure. Um, An extra step, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, there's one important thing to um, keep in mind when you do these settings in uh, Cloud Director, and uh, that's mainly based on your um, org VDC settings in Cloud Director. And Cloud Director only shows you when you define these settings in a one point in time view um, during the wizard when you create an org VDC. So adding uh, vRealize operations um, to the menu here gives you as a provider much more or a much better insight over time how your uh, utilization, your allocation, and your well, over commitment um, sort of <laughs> changes over time or just develops over time, which gives you a much better visibility into um, yeah what's going on in your uh, data centers. Mm -hmm. And um, since it, well, uh, monitors the actual consumption of the virtual machines, how they are done uh, down in vCenter, you also get some insights about, well, um, how much of the allocated um, space of your, your tenants actually are using or of their, are oversizing their virtual machines in some cases, or depending on your business model, something that might be something that you actually want because they are paying for that, um, for these resources, but it also gives you some insights about, um, yeah, how much of the um, over allocation you perhaps can use and uh, double dip without having a big risk of uh, performance problems. So if you realize yeah. operations adds a lot of uh, additional data, not only in a single point in time, but really over time um, to that picture for your capacity planning as a service provider. Yeah, exactly. And then also if you have like a, a multi-tenant environment, um, it, it helps you make a lot more sense because you, you know, you have different customers doing different things all, all in the same clusters. You know, it makes it a little easier to know how they all get along together within the same you know, underlying piece of your cluster. Yeah, so here you're looking at, at the cluster level. Um, I guess if you have the cloud director management pack, you're gonna see more sort of cloud director attributes in there. Yeah, that's yeah so if you, if you add in the vCloud Director Management Pack, you then start seeing the constructs from vCloud Director as well. So you see the relationships between 
uh, like your, your provider VDC to the cluster so you can see those, those relationships and, and such. Okay, I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. I think uh, a lot of service providers struggle with the allocation model concept. Um, and a lot of them tend to over allocate and hard, well, hard reserve resources. Um, one, to ensure the customer gets the service, service level they want. Um, and two, because it just makes it easier to, to sell, you know, customers understand yeah. it better as well. But obviously, when you do that, you're consuming resources that are going to be underutilized. Yeah, and, that, and that's the nice thing is, you know, like Jorg was saying, um, you, know, we, you can get the trending here from an allocation model perspective, you know, what it looks like and how you're, you're progressing on allocation. And then you can contrast that based on utilization. So you can see here, uh, like my utilization is much higher than my allocation. So my, my allocation ratio is probably, um, you know, is not set, you know, the best way it could. I could actually, you know, run even higher um, um, utilization here. Um, so it's, you know, it's the idea is it helps you understand um, from both perspectives and you can track like, uh, you know, what your current overcommit ratio is versus your planned overcommit ratio and how those change over time as well. So it's, yeah. And this is, um, so I can manage this in my data center, in, you know, focusing on a cluster, but what about different clusters and managing that from a, an aggregated view? So yeah, when you're talking about from an aggregated point of view, so if if you end up needing multiple instances of VRLS operations, so say you have uh, you know, multiple data centers and you have separate um, you know, separate environments in each of those, or maybe you have separate instances of VRLS operations for your dedicated customers, um, to be able to get that dedicated um, view uh, across all of those, we have this, um, what, what we call today the Federation uh, Management Pack. So what this is, this is, uh, basically another instance of VRLS operations where you install the, the Federation Management Pack on there. Um, and then this will, this connects to all of your other VRLS operations instances and pulls that data in together. So uh, just to give you an example, since we were talking capacity, so this is a dashboard now showing me the capacity um, from, from my other VRLS operations instances. So this is, you know, this is giving you that aggregated um, you know, view across the entire environment. So this allows you to have many VRLS operations instances, um, but you know, keep track of everything without having to log into each individual one um, to, to see what's going on. So this is the single pane of glass kind of thing. This is the single pane of glass. Yeah, so like I said, th this one gives you a view of capacity. You also have like um, alerts is an important one for, um, you know, for service providers. The, so we have here, this is the Federation alerts. Um, and what this does is this, this actually goes out and grabs the alerts from all of the child instances and gives you that, you know, that single pane of glass of all the alerts across all the instances. And if you want to go and troubleshoot an alert, you just, you click on it and it'll take you to the, that, the right fear ops instance. And then you can go in and actually troubleshoot, you know, what's, what's going on. The, the idea here with this, the Federation one is um, you don't, it doesn't have all of the data from the, the other real office operation instances. It, basically you pick what data you want to bring up and typically you don't bring virtual machines into this instance. Um, this is something you would mainly look at like from the infrastructure perspective. Um, and then if you need to look at a virtual machine, you'll go to the child instances to, to troubleshoot a virtual machine. Yeah, you made a good point there. So when we're looking at, um, you know, the totality of the service provider offering, right? It's, it's, it's potentially a, a resource-based um, cloud offering with VCD, or it's a private cloud offering with VCF maybe, or it's uh, maybe even a per VM flex model offering. Um, these things have supporting infrastructure, obviously, uh, org resource pools, provider resource pools, hosts, clusters, net networks is one kind of key play. How does the, the network view fit with the infrastructure view in vRealize operations? Yeah, so VRLS operations um, has management packs that let you monitor, um, like NSXV, for example. You know, th there's a management pack available for actually monitoring your NSX environment. Let me see if I can find one here. I can show you. Um, so here's NSXV sphere. 
So I can go in here and see, I, I can find all of my NSX environments. Um, and then I can go and you know, select it and then start troubleshooting from an NSX perspective. So it goes down to like the edges and the, the low balancers and all, you know, all the basically the capabilities of, yeah, of NSX. So this is giving you that NSX specific view. Now there, there is linkages between the, the vCloud director piece and NSX. Mm. So you can kind of transition uh, if you have, you know, if you have both, you can go from, you know, from VCD to the, the NSX piece and then continue on down um, from, from there. And this, you know, this will let you see you know, the virtual machines, the hosts, your, your networks across the host and stuff. So there's, there's a lot of visibility for NSX V and then we also have support for monitoring NSX T. Um, in in VLS operations, uh, there are other management packs that are available from uh, third parties that can be leveraged as well. Uh, so if you need other uh, you know, monitoring other devices, like uh, we also have the SNMP management pack that was released um, uh, by like a couple months ago. That one you can monitor any any device that supports SNMP. Um, so you know, network devices are you know, typically support SNMP. So that's that'd be an easy way to bring bring those. Um, additional devices into the mix as well. Yeah, Brendan, um, you mentioned one very important thing um, for service providers with this, um, yeah, we realize operations helps to relate different objects in the infrastructure. So when we see, have a look at the, uh, well, that dashboard from an NSXV perspective, we can see um, there are all, all these different um, NSX controllers in a VCD environment. Typically you have a, a pretty high number of um, edge devices for the different or uh, networks, perhaps even yep. for the VApp networks and so on, and uh, being able to very easily relate the uh, see the status obviously, and then relate the individual object uh, from an NSX perspective to their corresponding uh, organization and cloud director is very helpful, because that helps yeah. from both directions. Um, typically, in a service provider environment, the um, data center operational team uh, well is structured either um, well on the vertical layer, so you, you might have some. Uh, a network team responsible for uh, network connections and then some other team that's responsible for the physical hardware, the servers, for example, and the, the compute resources, perhaps even a, a separate storage team. And then on top of that, um, we have, well, the um, account managers and the account teams that are responsible talking to these individual tenants and the, uh, the customers that we have in, in VCD. And being able or using VR ops to connect these different things allows uh, to create some pretty good um, service quality because um, you minimize these round trip times between the, the iterations of communication between these different teams. If the network team sees an alert in one of the edges, they can directly notify exactly the account team or the, even the, the customer that is using um, the specific um, edge device in their cloud director and vice versa. If, I don't know, a first level support gets a call from a, a customer, customer complaining that something's wrong, either hard error or performance issue, then um, they can drill down from the uh, VCD view into the underlying infrastructure and see um, yeah, what components are sort of uh, affected by or might cause the, this issue. So this is a very important thing, especially in a service provider environment to be able to relate the different objects. Yeah, I, yeah, I definitely I completely agree. And that brings up another uh, interesting point. You know, we do have integration with um, realize, uh Network Insight. So if you, you know, if you actually use Network Insight to monitor the network infrastructure and you, know, you end up having you know, potential problems from the network perspective, that integration between Virilis operations and Network Insight will also bring in that, you know, that intelligence and the alerting capabilities of Network Insight into these NSX objects. So you could, you could potentially maybe have a network issue on, you know, that's you know, it's happening on the, maybe the network fabric, um, maybe you know it could be maybe an issue with BGP, um, something that Network Insight catches, and then that can be bubbled up into Virilis operations because because it's being monitored um, by Network Insight. And then again, you know, this comes back to having your single pane of glass. You know, it, you see that there's a network issue, um, and then use the relationships to identify the tenant that could potentially be impacted from from that as well. So in the way that um, so let's kind of split this up. Uh, in there's there's southbound integrations to the infrastructure to the other infrastructure managers like Network Insight, um, and then there's also a requirement for a service provider to the northbound for escalation, like York was mentioning. What is the uh, I guess let's take you know, the norm of service providers escalate service now, create a ticket into service now. What are the type of capabilities there for a provider? Um, 
with ticketing, for example? Yeah, so we have, um, we have several options available here. So this is our um, outbound sending. So this is how we can actually send out alerts. Um, so these are basically showing what we can integrate with. So we have um, automated actions that's actually doing um, actions based on uh, based on the alert automatically doing something. Um, so these are like the out of the box one, you know, power off a virtual machine or change the allocation to a virtual machine. Okay. There's log files, there's uh, smarts, rest notification. So this one is, Basically, it sends out a REST call when an alert happens. So if you have something that can you know, basically you know, intercept that REST call, um, then you can actually take action just based on that REST call. Um, then we have, you Might mentioned- something, As an example, I don't know, for PagerDuty or any other of these, um, yeah, sort of yep, <laughs> operation exactly. supporting tools. Yeah. Exactly, yeah, anything that, uh, that supports REST. Um, we have, Let's see, the email one is uh, is a popular one. So just you know, automatically send an email out when an alert happens. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> there's SNMP traps. So there are some systems that still uh, support traps. Um, so you can actually send a trap to um, some of these other systems um, and deal with them there. We have Slack that was just recently added. So you can just, if you have a Slack channel for your alerts, you can just have it, you know, automatically come up in your Slack uh, Slack channel, and then you can collaborate on resolving the issue through Slack. Um, it's mm -hmm. kind of nice. That's nice. And then ServiceNow, you know, is, is a very popular one. So this this can be used to actually automatically open a ticket in ServiceNow, and then if it automatically clears, you can configure it to automatically close the ticket in ServiceNow. So as you know, as it progresses through the the resolution process, you know, that you know you can configure it to to update that and that that automatic closure that's that's kind of an important point because um obviously when you look at slas you're looking at escalating to a ticket where at a certain point before the sla is broken um hopefully uh then if there is a subsequent clear event it might be that there needs to be two or three or some logic behind clear events for that ticket then to actually close down so for example a flapping link classic example right down up down up down up whatever it might be um you don't want a thousand tickets all being open, closed, open, closed, open, closed. <laughs> <laughs> right, and, and that's where you can you can kind of deal with those through um, some of the alert definitions. So you can say, you know, it needs to be clear for the you know this many um, collection cycles. Uh, um, yeah. So you know, if it goes up and down every you know, like once a minute, it won't automatically clear until you know it's been up for maybe fifteen minutes. Mm. So you can do things like that. So that that's. That's all in um, how you define those uh, alerts. Now, from a, when, sorry. when it comes to the alerts, uh, there is one important thing. Uh, well, with we realize operations and the uh, different management packs, there comes a whole lot of different alert settings um, for all different kinds of possible situations and issues in the environment. Um, that already provides a lot of value because just using these out of the box alerts. Um, which are defined in the management pack. So the VCD management pack comes with alerts that are really specific to Cloud Director, like IP pools running out of um, IP addresses that could be handled out, things like that for NSX. The NSX management pack comes with a whole lot of um, NSX and networking related alerts. And that already helps um, or provides instant value of virtualized operations because it saves you a lot of time to um, think about manually about this possible um, things that go wrong in the environment. And you get a lot of functionality with the out of the box alerts, but of course you can um, always yeah, customize them and, and uh, yeah, combine them to um, issues that you might see important or you might um, experience in your environment. Yeah, it, exactly. And then also um, something that, that you may, I, I hear quite a bit from service providers, there are some virtual machines that maybe the service provider doesn't necessarily care about. You know, maybe they don't manage the virtual machines. Um, so you know, they don't care if the virtual machine is running high on CPU. That's something that the customer deals with. Um, so you can go in and customize these alerts, like just turn off all the alerts for virtual machines and these clusters, but leave them on for my management cluster. Um, you can do things like that. So there, there's a lot of customization that can be done on these alerts as well. So you can define your own, you can disable them, you can enable them on a subset of the environment. So that there's a lot of flexibility here. So it, it, it may take some work to, you know, to tune them uh, for your, your particular environment, but um, you know, the, the idea is you know, they, they are very powerful. There's, there's a, lot of, a lot of insight that can be gleaned from them. 
And I guess it's, it's one of those things, right? You're getting a lot of value out of the box. You deploy the management pack and like you say, York, there's a lot of instant value, probably a lot of stuff you hadn't even thought about um, that you yep. need to think about and probably discover the hard way if it wasn't already there. Um, and tuning down is a lot easier than uh, starting to configure it up. All right, so very customizable alerts, very uh, customizable escalation. Um, what about the dashboard capability? Because you know, if I want to view things a certain way, what flexibility is there in the dashboards? So um, each management pack comes with dashboards um, out of the box. So they're like you know, the one I'm showing here is for NSX, um, but there are a lot of dashboards that come. Um, you know, from the system, like uh, I'll just pick one here, cluster configuration. So uh, this one is sh you know, helping you understand the configuration of your clusters. And you see, I've got some clusters with different configurations, some with DRS enabled, some with DRS disabled. Yeah. That's kind of suspicious, you know, and you know, the idea is you know, visually it helps you see you know, potential problems. Um, but there, like I said, there's, there's a lot of dashboards here and you can actually go in and create your own dashboards. Um, so there, there's a lot of, uh, flexibility there as well. So we have a lot of widgets that you go in and configure. So um, if we do have, have a place where, um, I know I create a lot of dashboards when I'm speaking with customers and I share them um, with the community. So we do have um, vrealize.vmware.com um, and this uh, VMware uh, Realize Operations Sample Exchange. There's a lot of dashboards. So these are ones that, that have been created by, um, by the community and been, have been shared. So if, you know, if there's not an out of the box dashboard to see you know, your particular use case, definitely encourage you looking here. Somebody may have already created one and shared it. Um, so there, you know, there's, there's a lot of great stuff out here, so. Yeah, for service providers, these dashboards are, again, um, a very important um, feature to increase their efficiency in operations and also just increase the service quality um, to their tenants because you can create these dashboards really based on the structure of your operating team. So yep. again, if you have a different uh, networking team, you can create dashboards really for all the network devices on a physical level, on a virtual level, and into, I don't know, the, the relationships in Cloud Director. But for example, if you have some, I don't know, a uh, very special cold standard um, support uh, offering for um, tenants, you could create some dashboard just for these account manager uh, with that tenant where they can see um, the account manager can see the complete stack and the health of the complete stack where this uh, the, the workloads of this tenant run in so they can see the, the capacity management they can but also see um, if there are some problems in the underlying infrastructure which are hopefully not directly uh, visible to the uh, to the tenant through vCloud Director because it's abstracted away but the account manager already sees okay well there might be some issue so um, I can talk with the uh, corresponding infrastructure folks to figure out what's going on there. And uh, I'm able to directly communicate uh, very uh, tightly. And I'm, I'm, I know what's going on in the, the whole stack, which creates a, a very good relationship with the um, customer typically. Yeah, for those for those customer service providers that have like very large named accounts that they, they manage on a, a bespoke basis, then I guess you can create some nice dashboards here, particularly for the technical account manager, the sales management yep. as well. You know, these are kind of pick up the phone type type dashboards. You're running out of CPU on this particular cluster um, versus, you know, technically this is uh, um, something that you want to consider enabling Mr. Customer. And, and for and... large scale, uh, well, or for service providers where you just have a, a complete different kind of different flavors of, of workloads and uh, a lot of different tenants that run different workloads. Um, having the dashboards and the, the capacity planning and um, just uh, see the what's going on in the data center might even help your uh, product management team to define the different offerings and refine and define much uh, yeah better the different uh, offerings in terms of services and, and uh, resource sort of bundling that you might want to offer to your tenants. Interesting point, yeah. And, and you also mentioned like the, the account managers. Um, uh, something else that uh, you know, that they typically would be interested in would also be like the reports. So these could be reports that they they would generate, you know, like like a capacity report or um, or utilization report for a customer. Um, so it's something like you can you can provide that for um, for them. So they can actually go in, you know, pick a report, run it based on you know the customers resources that you're using uh, and then 
you know, have that report, maybe give it to the customer um, as part of the, as part of the service, or uh, you know, maybe it could be something you know, value add. You know, like you, uh, one I hear is like um, you know, capacity report is a, is a you know, is a big one. Utilization is another one. We have um, you know, showing like your SLAs. The there's um, um, uh, drawing a blank. The other one. Um, oh, another one. It's kind of it's it's a little. Um, counterintuitive sometimes, but like a right sizing report. Um, so, you know, helping show the customer, you've got this many oversized virtual machines, you know, you could, you could take more advantage of the infrastructure that you're paying for if you go and look at these virtual machines and potentially right size them. You know, it kind of shows that, uh, you know, some providers that do offer that think, you know, it's like, you're, you're, you're doing what's in the best interest of the customer, not necessarily just trying to get as much money as you can from, from the customer. So, um, you know, it's, in some cases, it's kind of uh, kind of weird because you want the customer to, to consume a lot of resources, but on the other hand, you want them to you know, well, you know, get the best utilization out of it. Yeah, it's a trust thing, right? I think that that's an yeah. uh, established uh, relationship between service provider and the customer. Exactly. Better relationship when, you, when you're showing that kind of data. Absolutely. Uh, but I think the reporting is interesting, like you say. So for a technical account manager, perhaps, you know, the running of reports, the interpretation of the reports is really the important thing and providing yep as a value-added service to the customer. Exactly. Yeah. And there are a lot of reports available out of the box. And just like with dashboards, you can create custom dashboards. You can also create custom reports. Right. Um, so you can, you can run them on you know, pretty much any object in Brewless operations and take, take advantage of that uh, relationship hierarchy. So mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, there's, there's definitely a lot of power in the reports as well. So let's have a little, let's uh, backtrack a bit because we've, we've covered a lot of the capabilities, functionalities and specific service product concerns now. What would be, um, you know, from a commercial perspective, let's talk about the kind of the, the, the actuals. You're going to have a, a commercial tax on this. Obviously, there's something to pay uh, to VMware. And there's also going to be uh, a uh, appliance database to manage. What's, what's the footprint look like and what are the commercials in, in the VMware cloud provider program? Yeah, so um, basically what you, to do this, you would deploy a virtualized operations instance. Um, and for the use case of monitoring the infrastructure, typically the customer would not have access to this instance. It's, you know, it's usually only something that the, the provider would use. Mm -hmm. um, so you kind of have to decide what kind of data you want to collect with it. Um, so if you, if you collect everything, you know, the, all, everything for your infrastructure and all the virtual machines and all that stuff, you know, you would, that would either potentially bump, bump you up to a higher bundle, or if you wanted to, uh, you know, maybe only do a portion of the environment, you may, you know, pay for, um, like, per OSI. Um, so it, it really depends on you know, what you want to monitor and, you know, how much there is. So there are options of, like, um, like you can exclude virtual machines. Like if you don't want to monitor any virtual machines in your shared multi-tenant cloud, um, you, know, you know, that's something that the, you know, the customer deals with. So you don't care about the virtual machines. You can go in and configure it to just not monitor those virtual machines and actually end up saving money because you don't have to pay to monitor those virtual machines because you're not monitoring them. So there, there are some things that you can look at from that perspective as well. So you just choose to monitor what you want to monitor and you just pay for what you're, you're actual mon actually monitoring. So there is a, um, a standalone model then from um, a uh, flex perspective and uh, yeah. which is per OSI. So that's anything that isn't uh, kind of a VM, uh, like a third party, like a Cisco rotor or something like that. Um, and then there's the flex model, which is per VM uh, payment. And you got, is it standard, advanced, and enterprise, the three tiers of vRealize operations available in the program? Yeah, so if you do the standalone version, you, you can choose between standard, advanced, and enterprise. Um, the, if the ones that are part of the flex bundles are all uh, enterprise. OK, OK. Well, except for the flex core. The flex core one is the chargeback edition. Um, which is, is different, but yeah. Okay, cool. So a lot of value there to be attained. What about the, uh, uh, the footprint? What are we talking about? So we mentioned um, the provider could roll this out for themselves. Um, they could, if they wanted to do like a managed reporting service and monetize that straight away. Um, yeah. What sort of footprint are we looking at for production? It, it really depends on how many objects you monitor and, um, 
in the environment. So we have the sizing guide. Um, so if you just Google re realize operations um, sizing guide, mm -hmm. this will take you to a KB. So we'll see we have here, um, this is the KB 20937A3. Um, from this KB, we have sizing guides for each version. So I'll go to 8.1. And what this does is this actually tells you what your, um, you know, basically what you can, what kind of footprint you need to be able to monitor your environment. There's a Excel spreadsheet here. You enter in how many hosts, how many VMs, how many, you know, all, all the, the objects in your environment. And then it tells you, you know, if you don't want HA, you need this many nodes with this many, this much resources per node. Um, if you do want HA, then it's this. If you want continuous availability, it's this. Uh, so it, it helps you with that whole sizing exercise. So I would say it, it, it really depends on you know, how much you're, you're monitoring, how many objects. So th this is, this is definitely the way to go to figure that out. Um, just, just so I'm aware of this, you've got V-Realize operations nodes there and small, medium, large, extra large. Um, you then got remote collectors. Now, is the remote collector um, something that would be used to manage a separate environment like a, a private cloud from a service provider essentially, or is this for remote um, site, customer tenant site collection? Yeah, so if you're if we're talking about the the use case of the partner monitoring infrastructure, it, this would be monitoring like remote locations. So this would be you, know, you have virtualized operations in maybe your primary data center, and then you can put remote collectors in your other data center locations, and then that centralizes the collection of the data. Then it kind of when it comes over the wire back to your main virtualized operations instances, it takes up less, um, you know, less network bandwidth. It's, it's a bit more optimized to, to come over, to, to go over there. It also is useful for if you have environments that are behind firewalls, um, you know, it minimizes the amount of holes you have to punch in the firewalls. You deploy the, the remote collector behind the firewall, allow the, you know, the specific for, ports needed for it to communicate through. Um, and then, um, and then you're, you know, you can start monitoring behind those uh, those firewalls as well. Um, typically, I, I would say you probably wouldn't monitor a customer's um, on-prem environment with this, but um, I mean, it, it technically is possible. Um, but uh, if if you were monitoring a customer's environment, um, you probably would want to use a, a separate instance of VRLS operations. Okay, it's just so you're not um, combining your data with other production sources. So. Yeah, it, it'll be a little easier to, to keep track of what, uh, you know, what you're looking at. Okay, okay. So a remote collector could be, I'm just thinking for the, the, the broader picture with, um, you know, things like cloud director service coming up in, um, in VMware cloud on AWS. Remote collector could be the sort of thing you would then consider using to collect data about that endpoint. Yeah, so you can definitely re deploy remote collectors in VMware Cloud and AWS and use that to monitor your VMware Cloud and AWS environment. Um, that, that definitely is a very common thing to do, especially if you don't expose um, like vCensor to the, um, the public internet. Mm -hmm. you, know, you make it where you have to come over VPN. Uh, you would have to have a remote collector in, in the, the VMware Cloud and AWS environment because you can't get to it over the internet. Um, so yeah, there, there's definitely, definitely use cases for that. And some of the others is uh, you can even do it locally. It's like in your data center um, where VLS operations is stored, you can actually deploy remote collectors locally. And that helps like if you wanted to do DR failover, um, you wanted to you know, fail over VLS operations to another data center, you can keep that collection basically local in the data center. You don't have to bring it with you to, to the other location. Um, if, you know, because you know, if, that, if that data center you're leaving is is you know not usable anymore for whatever reason, you know there's no reason to bring that stuff that that will no longer work. So it, it, it also helps from from like a DR perspective. Okay, got it. And what is the uh, database at the back end? So it has it, the databases are all built into the appliance. So there's nothing external that's needed. You just everything is all in all all in this appliance. So it's a single OVA you deploy, and it's all self-contained. Um, there are several databases that are used in there. There's Cassandra and Postgres um, are, are some of the databases used by it. But you don't have to deal with any of that. It's it's all, it's kind of a black box. If there is problems with that, you, you would go through uh, GSS for, for help. There's no database ops, so I need to kind of look after this. Nope. All right, very nice. I think well, even the- it's all in the um, yeah, even the HA clustering is pretty much built inside, right? 
So you don't. Need it is. To do a so lot yeah, of HA. There's no configurations to set it up and operate it. Uh, exactly. HA is basically an option you enable. So you just deploy however many appliances you need. You turn on HA, and now you can survive the failure of one node. And then um, we also have continuous availability, which allows you to deploy VRL's operations across two different fault domains. Um, so if you if you have two data centers that are um, that you want to, to basically stretch for your wireless operations across that, you can actually have it where it can survive the failure of one data center, and you know everything will just kind of fail over to the other the, the other fault domain. So that's in the you know in environments that are really critical, you need that higher level of, of availability. Um, that is that is an option now as well, and you know like say it, it'll it'll survive the failure of an entire fault domain. Brilliant, brilliant. Okay, so. Um... All right, so just uh, just to kind of wrap it up here, then I think we've we've covered quite a lot of the the service provider capabilities from a um, you know a high level, and um, you know looked at the the type of um, coverage they would have. Um, just from a, a cost perspective, just to recap, I've opened the um, the product user guide here, and um, standard advanced enterprise either as a standalone um, points per per VM or OSI per month, which is basically a non VM. Um, or it can be used as a flex model, which is per uh, gigabyte, V gigabyte of RAM. Um, and obviously, VROP's chargeback is like the fourth version, if you like, but that's the, the inclusive in uh, the flex core for chargeback management. Okay, brilliant. Well, listen, thank you very much, Brandon, for all your help and guidance here, and, and Jorg as well. Thanks for, for having me. This. And uh, I think on the next one, we should dive into some of the monetization aspects of this. Uh, now we've done the kind of the broad scope of how the provider can use it. Um, I think the next kind of piece of logical uh, logical step is how they can actually sell it and make money out of it. Exactly. Brilliant. Well, listen, thank you very much for your time, guys. Uh, thank you. Cheers.